Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. My name is Katherine Crangelo and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here at Bullhorn. And I'm very excited to be joined by Jason Heilman, who's going to talk about candidate engagement, but, but more specifically how to boost hires through your ATS. Jason is the founder of Herefish and one of our marketplace partners and an expert in candidate engagement and we're definitely looking forward to, to today's discussion. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know that today's session will be recorded and we'll send out a copy of the recording and a few other helpful resources on this topic within the next 24 hours. Uh, definitely feel free to submit your questions in the questions pane throughout. We want this to be as interactive as possible um, and we want to make sure that we address all your questions with, with Jason here because he is the expert. Um, great. Uh, with that, I'll turn things over to Jason. All right. Great. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for everyone for attending. Um, we're going to basically today go through, uh, as Catherine mentioned, a number of points in terms of candidate engagement. Um, we'll just start off with a very brief introduction. Um, as uh, Catherine mentioned, my name is Jason Heilman I'm with Herefish. Um, we've been doing candidate engagement since about 2014. Uh, over that time, we've worked very closely with our clients to engage literally millions of candidates and put together hundreds of different campaigns to look at the different segments and different opportunities to, to dig into their candidate database. Prior to Herefish, my co-founder and I uh, each spent about seven years with an ATS and a variety of different roles. Um, throughout that time, uh, we really got a very clear understanding of how a broad range of staffing firms are using their ATS today. Um, what that led us to was really identifying some opportunities to take better advantage of all the resources that are hidden within the ATS. Um, this is ultimately what led to Herefish. Um, the primary purpose of Herefish is to, to help companies take better advantage of their ATS. So uh, I think that's kind of why we're here to talk about that. Um, so really the short version of all of this is that we actually and I really love talking candidate engagement. Uh, and I'm very excited to talk about this with everyone today and that's maybe because I'm just a big dork, uh, but really I think that uh, there's a true massive untapped opportunity within every staffing firm's ATS to really get more placements out of it. So we're going to cover just kind of four broad topics here today, um, just kind of why now is the time to start. So obviously you're here, you know some of the reasons. We'll kind of talk to that quickly, um, some of the changes in the market that are leading to this to be so many firms' number one priority uh, in 2017. We'll talk about ways to ensure that you're, you see successful outcomes. Um, by committing to success and kind of how to do that. Um, and then we'll dig in uh, into more detail about where to start um, and how to evaluate your starting position and which segment of your ATS will offer you the most value for your time. Uh, and then different ways to communicate. So we'll talk about some broad tips, but also again, some very specific ideas of how to talk to your different candidate audiences. Um, and of course, we've got a half hour, so this is, uh, we're gonna try to get in, into a little bit of detail and execution uh, but we've got quite a few resources available on Born site uh, relating to candidate engagement, and then also Herefish uh, that dig a couple layers deeper into really creating your strategy uh, and executing on it. Um, so now just jumping into why is now the time to start. Um, so the big one that I think is obvious for everyone, we've got a prosperous economy plus this talent shortage, uh, which really relates to the talent gap. Um, so your firm is brought in to find the difficult jobs or the ones that buy a lot of volume. So you feel this squeeze even more than your clients, uh, which is why uh, I think a recent survey from Bullhorn really shows that it's the number one barrier to growth for staffing firms uh, is, is the talent shortage. Um, so again, that's a, a good reason to get started and figuring out new and creative ways to, to take care of that problem. Um, also today, Every experience matters more than it has in the past. Uh, as we can see here, 84% of people trust online reviews as much as personal recommendations. Um, so the most important part of your employment brand isn't really your website or your application process. It's how candidates feel after interacting with your company. And there's hundreds or thousands of them almost every day. So really having a good systematized process in place for engaging with them is going to help make sure that you're is positive. Um, and then candidates they actually want to hear from you. They want you to engage with them. Uh, they want to be treated well, uh, but they just they want to hear about the, the opening. So despite this talent shortage that we're all suffering from, 
Um, Seventy-one percent of people are actively looking or open to discussing a new job, um, and that was from an Indeed survey. So these people actually want, these candidates want to hear from you. Um, they maybe don't always want to hear about jobs, but if you've got the right one, they're likely going to be open to discussing it. Another important reason for why now might be the time to start is that ultimately you as a staffing firm want to change the dynamic of your current situation. So uh, this is from a survey that, that Herefish did of about four or five hundred staffing firms. Um, asked what their current top source of hire was. Uh, and combined, about 61% said job boards in LinkedIn versus about 31% for ATS and referrals. Then we asked, what's your ideal hire source. Um, and you can see the numbers almost flip. People want to build their ATS uh, and, and get more hires from their ATS uh, and want to reduce their reliance on job boards and have more of an organic candidate feed flow. Um, and again, we think that candidate engagement is the way to get to that goal. Um, and then again, we ask a question. So we also ask, uh, of those of you who proactively engage with your candidates, uh, so we asked if you proactively engage, uh, and then also that same number one source, but what we found was those that do proactively engage are 53% 50 more likely for their ATS to be the number one source of hire, and then 43% more likely for the referral to be their number one source. Um, so what, what that tells us uh, is that the way to make the switch from job boards and LinkedIn uh, to switching to make it more primarily ATS and referrals is to really develop a well-executed candidate engagement plan. And I think we've got a, a poll here that we want to run to see uh, kind of what, what the audience and who, who's doing it today. Yeah, that's right. So hopefully everyone can see this and it's working okay, but our, we want to take a quick poll and kind of share the results with everyone, but the question is, do you have a candidate engagement strategy in place today? Um, so hopefully it seems like the results are coming in. We'll give it another 15 seconds. Awesome. All right, I'm going to close this poll out. All right. And let me share these so results, I can see the results out with everyone. Show. Oh, there we go. Cool. Perfect. Awesome. So it looks like um, about half have one and about half either don't or unsure if they've got one. So I think that's perfect. So it seems like maybe half of the people here would say that they are, and I'm maybe making a leap, but that they're here to figure out maybe opportunities to improve that engagement strategy or at least maybe you see a benchmark of what others are doing. Um, and the other halves are looking for, for opportunities to start, start building that. Awesome. All right. So we'll keep that in mind. All right. So first thing uh, to talk about here is just committing to success. So uh, there's compelling reasons to start, uh, but of course as, as you take on a new initiative, you want to make sure that it's success. So here are just some ways uh, that we've found that help to ensure success in your candidate engagement. So the first one is just to have an executive sponsor. So the reason why that may be more important than in some industries is that staffing, uh, again, in the survey that we, we performed uh, earlier last year, um, if a company is under about $100 million in revenue, uh, they reported that uh, there's only about a 50% chance that they've got a marketer. So uh, usually kind of a, a lead nurturing or engagement plan uh, would be owned by a marketing head. Most firms don't necessarily have one, or at least half in the, in the uh, kind of mid-sized market. Um, and even those that do are primarily more focused on the business side of marketing than necessarily the candidate. Because obviously, we've got two different audiences to market to. Um, so identifying an executive sponsor to help push the initiative through, potentially identify funding, do all the things that are necessary to create any successful initiative in an organization uh, is really key to success. Uh, and then next is just socializing it. Uh, so really making it part of your DNA, something that it's not something that you do, but who you are. Um, you, it really is part of who your firm is and why you're different. Uh, give it a name, kind of brand the initiative and about how you love candidates and how you treat them differently. Um, and then when you identify success, so these are placements or submissions, uh, whatever may happen specifically from these initiatives uh, are going to help to get kind of broader buy-in uh, and again ultimately lead to success. Uh, then of course, like anything, incentivize. Uh, so recruiters 
are rightfully focused on kind of what's most close to the money. Um, this gets them there, but it's ultimately it's kind of more of a of a strategic initiative. So the fruit takes a little longer to bear. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a financial incentive uh, or an actual trophy like this picture, uh, but really just even focus on the activities that go in to your engagement strategy. Uh, again, will just help to to lead to success and get buy-in, um, and then systematizing it. So a lot of this is ultimately going to be one to many communications or processes that we're asking numerous recruiters throughout the organization to change. So having a good system in place, whether that's technology or business processes, again, are also going to help to lead to these changes. Um, and then the next thing we'll talk about here is kind of, kind of why that's so important. So um, one part of this here is just uh, in terms of committing to success. This is an interesting statistic uh, from Inside Squared um, about connect rates uh, based on the number of phone attempts. Um, so you can say usually the average is probably two or three that kind of conventional wisdom would say. Um, but what this kind of shows is that obviously although the number goes down, it kind of stays steady as you go through and basically people that are making 10 or 11 plus attempts, half of their connections happen after the third call. And so it's not easy for a recruiter to pick up the phone that many times. Uh, they need to have something kind of helping to drive that behavior. Um, and the same is true for email. Um, most email chains, and this, this uh, data point, just to, to kind of point out, is actually from kind of the market at large. This isn't specific to recruiting and staffing. Uh, but most email conversations, if there's not a reply, stop after the first email chain. You can see 70%. And then 19% after the second and continuing to go down. But the story, much like phone, is that email connection rates continue to stay level uh, after the third attempt. So basically what this is kind of showing is that after, in this case, the, the third attempt, you've still got about a 25% potential to connect with someone and get a reply. Uh, over time, they continue to stay focused and be persistent. Um, and, the, and the unique thing and where the real opportunity in email is that in relative terms, it's much easier to automate, of course, than phone calls. Um, so getting an email connection um, is ultimately uh, easier than, than getting a phone call. Most people still don't do it, but this is, again, one of the areas that allow you to be different. All right, so now I'm um, talking about starting why we want to start and starting with success in mind. So now let's talk about kind of where or even who to start with. So. Um, kind of there's, there's a couple of different ways maybe to view to view the question or kind of when to look at the question through is kind of one is solving a problem and, one, and the other is addressing the opportunity. So you know, one way to look at it is to say where is our candidate experience suffering the most and it's ultimately leading to, to negative outcomes. Uh, so maybe that's kind of responsiveness to applications or uh, regular follow-up with existing contractors. Um, and then there's where we receive the most value. So again, who knows what that may be, but again, maybe that's probably has something to do with current contractors. It may have something to do with kind of the, the dead or inactive portions of your database. So there's going to be a couple different ways to frame uh, the opportunity. But if we look at the ATS, um, it kind of just take very broad buckets of where most staffing firms' candidates lie. You've got your candidates that are in process, so people that are applying to your jobs currently, uh, maybe in the last couple months, candidates that your recruiters are actively talking to. Uh, you've got your top candidates, so this is the list that uh, just about every recruiter has. They have their top 100 or 200 candidates that maybe they've worked with them in the past, uh, maybe they know they're great, just don't have the job opening or haven't gotten the chance, to, the timing hasn't worked out. Then, of course, we've got the current consultants, um, people that are on billing today, and then the inactive. So all the, the tens or hundreds of thousands of people in your database that maybe you haven't spoken to, and you know, that, who knows where that, that mark starts, that maybe it's six months, maybe it's a year. Um, so how do you make the decision of where to start? Um, you go by count. Um, so this is kind of what a normal database might look like. Um, we've got a decent chunk of people that are actively being worked with in process. Uh, we've got your um, top candidates. Again, they're a relatively small number. 
You've got your current consultants, you know, that's maybe 10 or 15 per uh, per recruiter. Uh, but then you've got your inactive. As I mentioned, maybe that's 10,000, maybe that's 100,000, maybe it's in the millions. Uh, but you've got this very large pool. So, so how do you decide which one of those is the right place to start? And, and maybe by the count is one way. Uh, the other way to look at this is engaging with the people who are currently creating the value for you. So kind of protecting the base, kind of protecting the, the revenue and ensuring kind of a, a shorter term flow of it, I guess. Um, so that would likely come from your current consultants, um, the people that you want to make sure that are having a great experience, stay billing, and ultimately uh, are sending you referrals and, and redeploying. Um, or, you know, the top candidates, again, they're the top candidates and, and the candidates in process are the closest to being next uh, to be hired, right? They're, they're actively looking. They're kind of ready to go. Um, or there's the got a little bit of a slide issue here. So uh, the other one here would just be by the potential value, which is actually, okay. Um, sorry, the potential value would uh, kind of replace the, uh, the, the current line with the, where the inactive is. So um, you might show that, you know, you think there's a lot of potential gold in your database. Um, and looking at the inactives might be the area where you can Potentially find the most value, followed maybe close second to the current consultant. So, so those are some ways to think about it. But we'd actually like to, to do another poll uh, to get an idea of where you would start. So, awesome. Yeah, we'll yeah. that if Let's see. Hold on. All right. Yeah. So, if everyone kind of take a look at this, I think in your opinion, which segment of candidates would you target to get the most value through a candidate engagement strategy, as Jason kind of outlined? And you can focus on your inactive candidates, in process candidates, top candidates, or your current consultants or employees. Looks like the results are coming in. We'll give it another ten seconds or so. Awesome. All right, I'm going to close the poll and share the results here. Okay. Interesting. So um, I think this actually this aligns pretty well with kind of what we've heard over the years. So uh, the top two are the inactive and tops, um, followed by the in process and then, uh, or sorry, the current and then in process. I think probably the idea that the in process, the recruiter is kind of actively managing that relationship. Um, the inactive, you know, they're, again, kind of as I mentioned, there's this kind of big potential for gold. The top candidates, uh, there's just uh, there's just such an opportunity. Uh, they're kind of so close to being the right one and ready. Um, so this is great. So what, what we'll do is uh, kind of in the next section, we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of ideas and ways to communicate. So we'll focus on those two uh, that everyone kind of mentioned as being their top, we'll, we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail um, about maybe some ideas of what to say to those people. Okay, so uh, hey, Jason, so now we'll talk oh, about how to do it. Yeah, yeah, please. Do I, just an uh, interesting question just came in and I thought it might be relevant to kind of talk about now. Okay. Um, a question from Edwin, he, he asked, wouldn't it be good to secure those in process first and then move to the next? Do you have, do you have thoughts on that? Sure, um, yeah, so I, I certainly don't disagree. I, I think um, you know, the, the ones that are in process, um, my guess, again, is that people are, kind of the assumption is that the recruiters are actively maintaining that relationship. Uh, but where I think maybe there's a big opportunity for inactives, especially in kind of today's BMS-driven environment, is that we get so many job openings uh, and they're filled, or, or the, you know, the, the requirement for submissions is within two to three days. Uh, but if you've posted a job online, that posting stays up usually for 30 days. Uh, so a very large portion of these candidates are applying for jobs that you're no longer placing. And, and again, hopefully, you know, I know that there's slots and you can move jobs in and out, but, but it seems like this is a pretty common issue. So I, I certainly think there's a lot of value for, for the in-process in terms of the, the applicants, because my guess is that if most firms went and looked at their candidates that are applying to positions, is it far fewer after actually getting followed up with um, than you might think. Um, and again, it, that's to no fault of the recruiters. Their job is to find candidates for the current jobs that are open. 
So once that exact job is closed, even if there's one like it, they may not always have the wherewithal to go back and maybe try to re resurface someone. Uh, so there's that, and then again, I think there's the opportunity to, to support the recruiters in their active process. So, um, I, you know, I, I, in my in my personal opinion, I think that you know, and again, ideally, you get to the point where you're reaching all of the different segments of the database. It's just a matter of, you know, in a world of limited time and resources, which ones people think are going to kind of have the best output for them. Got it. And just another question that came in kind of around a similar topic from James. Would you say that the in-process and top candidates are the same? Because we'd always kind of want to have those top candidates in process. I think that's a good point. So uh, I think potentially. So I think if you're thinking about the top candidates, you may go for a period of um, six or eight or nine months uh, before you've got the right job and before you've got the right thing to place them with. Um, whereas, although that may be the same for the in process, the, the top candidates aren't necessarily, at least in the way that I would describe them, they're not necessarily looking for a job today and right now. Um, they may be very happy where they are, but you know you've got such a good relationship with them that if the right opportunity comes along, you can bring, bring that to them. So when, when we think about to communicate with people that are in process, they're actively job seeking. You probably want to focus your messaging quite a bit on, and we actually do talk about this, but it's perfectly good time to talk about it. You probably want to focus your messaging on the active job seekers more around jobs and job seeking tips uh, and, ways that, and ways to better prepare for interviews or resumes. Uh, whereas your top candidates, it's really more about building and maintaining the relationship. So it, you know, it generally looks a little bit more like uh, personalized communication directly from the recruiter, uh, not necessarily all the recent job openings. Uh, the recent applicants, you want to keep them coming back to the site until the right job kind of brings them into an active process uh, versus the, uh, the top candidates that isn't necessarily the exact, in, the exact point to get them always there. It's to make sure that they're ready to take your call uh, when you do have the right opportunity. Awesome, thanks. All right, great question. Thank you, guys. Uh, all right, so uh, so now it's just kind of what do we say to them and, and kind of how do you say it best? Uh, so kind of the first things to think about is you want to think in their terms. Um, first of all, kind of what's worked in the past. So, um, you know, how they previously like to communicate. Is it over the phone? Uh, what time of day has worked well? Is it after work? Is it at the lunch break? Is it midday? Any time of day? Um, you know, and, and or uh, also just again the actual method. So is it phone, email, SMS, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, just kind of thinking in that way before you kind of attempt to engage. Uh, but then the other really important part of this is kind of what's in it for the candidate. Uh, really, it's not. It can't just be about job openings. Whenever we're trying to kind of maintain communications for a long period of time, they just. In some cases, you may have the position of their lifetime. Um, but you may not. So you have to be able to offer them more than just that. And that's, that's one area where, again, going back to the, the survey that we previously did, uh, kind of building a library of blogs and different resources on, on your site. Again, maybe that's about career advice. Uh, maybe that's about uh, networking, job hunting type advice. Uh, that's a very, uh, at least in the way that they kind of I or we think about things in terms of offering value first, it's a, it's a really important vital part of creating your engagement strategy. Um, and then one quick note, so, so you might wonder kind of how many staffing firms do or don't. So what, what we showed in that survey was that about 56% of companies reported that they uh, create blogs or resources for candidates. Um, and then going back to the marketer or not, companies with a marketer are a little over twice as likely to create those blog postings. Um, so just in terms of thinking about where you stack rank or where you stand against your competitors, either you can say by having a blog you're kind of doing whatever everyone else is, or you're ahead of the pack of people that aren't. So that's kind of the what is it for the candidate? Um, personal. So this is you know this may be obvious, but it's kind of always good to come back to when you're when you're when your people are writing an email, really think about is the email different and what you would write to the other 20 people that you're about to email that day. Is there something that makes that stand out, that message different? So really think again about ways that you can uh, 
this email is very specific to the reader, uh, especially in those kind of one-to-one -one types of communications. Um, and then for the more broad, kind of one-to-many communications, so if you're sending out group messaging, take advantage of what you do know of them from your ATS. So, you know, you say name, uh, but it's funny, it, that really makes a very big difference, just merging in their name. Any time that you've got the opportunity to do that, and even using it in the subject, um, it, it's such a simple thing, but it actually makes a big difference. Um, their specialization, uh, so, you know, when we're sending them job openings, make sure the more that you can kind of have those right, even if it's not saying here are three jobs that I think are perfect for you, uh, at least getting them in the right ballpark is certainly going to help your outcomes. Uh, because as we know, the data isn't always as accurate as we'd like it to be within the ATS. Uh, and then the time since your last conversation as well uh, is a good one. So, you know, you don't want to send an email saying, we haven't spoken for a while, uh, when in reality you just talked to them. There's a note saying you just talked to them last week. You just have to make sure that kind of those marketing and broad messaging kind of align with what's happening in the, in the ATS. Uh, and then being creative. So uh, this is an example of an email um, that I think does a good job of, uh, of being different and sticking out. So again, you can see here, you can read the whole thing, but basically in the first line, it kind of has a joke talking about how someone's sporting the resume around to be you. Uh, later, it says it acknowledges that it's an automatic email and it's sent by a mindless robot, but then kind of charms them a bit. Uh, and then it says kind of the, the usual, it's not the usual, blah, blah. So they actually kind of, if this email that would continue, they actually give them some additional resources and help them to understand the hiring process. Okay, so now uh, for how to communicate. Uh, the, the last thing is just kind of networking. So again, we won't spend a lot of time here. This is kind of obvious stuff. But, but when we think of social networks and networking online, uh, definitely don't just think in terms of posting your job openings. Again, try to create interactions. So, you know, what's some crazy interview uh, questions that you've heard? Um, or adding value, you know, you know, again, posting these different resources. Uh, and then also being a part of different LinkedIn groups. And then the same goes for face-to-face, -face, being a part of different networks um, and actually getting recruiters out in front of candidates. And this isn't just for the short term, of course, it's important to hire these candidates, but having your recruiters actually know them well and understand their needs uh, and understand what they care about is something that really helps when you're face-to-face. -face. Right. Um, and then now just some ways to, to communicate. We're actually uh, kind of short on time here, so we're going to kind of go through these a little bit more quickly. Uh, and we actually already talked about a, a lot of this, but in terms of the end process, and the goal is a consistent follow-up and maintaining interest, so setting reasonable expectations and directing them back to, to recent openings and then again offering resources for the job hunt. Um, your top candidates, we talked about this, it's about maintaining the relationship and keeping them warm and interested, uh, kind of a little bit more personal, it's about the relationship, maybe not as much about the job. Um, current consultants. current consultants. Um, an important one here is just kind of effectively onboarding them, building the relationship while they're on the job, and then ultimately redeploying them when it's time for them to come off. Um, so again, here, just information about the company and process when they're coming on, connecting them with the recruiter, and then jobs as it's ended. Um, and then the inactive, uh, again, we talked about this a little bit, but, but here the idea is really about creating a relationship with them. And again, this is going to be a one-to-many communication. We've got tens or hundreds of thousands of people. So personalizing it where we can, but ultimately, you're going to be very different from your competition if you're just attempting to reach out to them and not offer them jobs every time you do it. Um, so creating that relationship by offering value first and educating them. Um, and then when they are ready for a change, you'll have, you know, there's the way, you know, some of what Herefish does, but it has the ability to identify when they're now looking for jobs um, and communicate with them when they are ready for a change. Um, so again, it's about adding value where they are um, and then not really focusing on jobs until you can tell that they're now looking at jobs on your website and that they're interesting in talking about that more. So now just some, some kind of quick tools uh, within the ATS, uh, you know, the ability to search uh, and save lists, although it's so incredibly basic, 
it's really, uh, when we talked about those different audiences, it all comes down to this, being able to do that well and segment your audiences based on their specialization, based on your interaction timeline. Um, so that's obviously an important one. Um, automatically following up, uh, when a no one note's added, automatically reminding you to follow up with more. Uh, and then the best times and methods to reach them we talked about. Um, in terms for one to many, um, this is where you'd have your ability to group email from the ATS. Kind of the, the next level of that would be something like a constant contact or MailChimp. These are great tools. They uh, offer probably a higher level of number of emails they can send, uh, but a, a similar functionality to what your ATS might. Uh, and then going further into something like a Marketo or HubSpot or Pardot, these are advanced marketing automation tools. They, they likely require uh, some integration with an ATS, uh, but, but once it's there, there's really no limit to what they can do. Um, and then HereFish uh, is an important one as well. Uh, this is w what we do. So we're essentially like uh, Marketo and HubSpot and Pardot and that we're a marketing automation tool for staffing. Um, but again, because we're all about staffing. We're integrated with the ATS. Um, and again, because it's staffed, we know that the marketing resources aren't always there. Uh, we offer kind of content as part of it, uh, a lot more services. Um, and uh, of course, the, the, the technology that's needed to perform all these different types of campaigns and pull the right people in at the right time and stop messaging. Uh, but, but it's very important that uh, someone's there to kind of help you to develop your strategy and then execute the campaigns. And that's it for the, that, that was the here fish pitch. So in case anybody's wondering, there's, there's no more of that. So um, basically what engagement ultimately lets you do is kind of be the type of company that treats candidates well, people are excited to work with, uh, employees are proud to refer their friends to, it leverages your ATS to hire quickly, um, and then you can confidently tell your clients that you're different. Uh, and then just, Kind of for more resources, these are some of the others that are available on uh, the Herefish website and Bullhorn website. Obviously, all of these are free and available for download. Uh, these dig a lot deeper into uh, to everything we talked about today and quite a bit more. Um, so those are all available, and as Catherine mentioned, she'll send some links to see those. I mean, I'm sorry we went over a little bit here, so no, we have a lot of time for questions. Yeah, no, no, no worries. And then thank you again, Jason. I think this was really great and it hopefully helped people get an understanding of how they can kind of kickstart their, their candidate engagement strategy if they don't already have one in place today. Um, I do, I, there were a bunch of questions that came in from a couple people that are Bullhorn customers kind of asking around how, um, how they can kind of, uh, execute on these things within the Bullhorn environment. And uh, what I will do is I'll share out a webinar that we actually hosted uh, last month that kind of went took, took all the things that Jason was talking about and kind of showed them in the Bullhorn lens, if you will. So I'll definitely share that out with people. I think it's a really good resource. It was led by our trainers. And they'll kind of get into the details around how to build those lists and how to send those mass emails, so on and so forth. So I'll definitely share the, that out with everyone. Um, and, and yeah, thank you again, Jason. I think this was really great. Um, and hopefully uh, everyone is walking away with a couple different takeaways and you can absolutely go to look further into those resources that Jason mentioned. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Have a great right. day and thanks for, thanks for joining. Thanks everyone.